This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Ty Andros, Ty is the president of TraderView, publisher of the Ted Bits website, and writer and editor of his very well-recognized newsletter, also named Ted Bits. Good morning, Ty. Welcome back to Macroanalytics. Good morning, Gord. Thank you for having me. I asked Ty to share some of his thinking with us this morning on the cloud Piven strategy. It called the planned collapse of the United States free economy and financial system as a title on an outstanding uh, piece of work that Ty has done and will soon be made available on his website, tedbits.com, or any of those who have signed up to his free newsletter service. They'll be mailed it automatically when it's available. I asked Ty just to take a few of the slides to highlight some of the key points within this document, which is fairly extensive. And I have the first slide up here, Ty. Well, Gord, uh, right now, um, as you know, and it's been unfolding, but... Uh, the United States economy is collapsing in real terms. And it's being done, uh, I believe, on purpose. Uh, it's an organized strategy between progressives. And uh, what it is is uh, a number of times over the last uh, three or four months uh, on our uh, talks uh, and in my newsletters, I've talked about socialists smelling the end zone. And these people have basically uh, confiscated uh, the wealth of America in one way or another and uh, the independence. They've made a lot of people dependent on government and I believe that was a major source of the support for Obama in the last election was uh, all the new uh, government dependencies put together since uh, his first election in 2008. And um, you know the bureaucracy. It just uh, it's a it's an organized strategy of uh, overwhelming the government, uh, where the government will not be able to uh, uh, deliver and uh, will become bankrupted. And during the crisis that ensues, uh, uh, they're going to try to rip up the Constitution, what's left of it, and and uh, take uh, you know take uh, power to save you. Uh, day, well, in this case, it's uh, two professors from the late 70s who um, Obama is quite uh, enamored with, but all progressives. Um, it's a, it's a, it's been around for a long time. It's actually been being put in place for 30 or 40 years. And um, they are, um, I'm going to call it, uh, you know, I don't want to say black helicopter, but you have to understand that the, that the Democratic Party and a lot of the Republican Party are nothing more than big government progressive socialists. And uh, they don't try to like to use that language, but uh, uh, these people are just uh, there to uh, take your freedom and your money and transfer it to themselves and their supporters, just like any other socialist uh, country. Uh, you know, people think that it's uh, redistribution from the rich to the poor. No, it's it's redistribution from the poor to the government for redistribution. And it's a, a thing, um, you know, unsound money is part of, of uh, I'll call it uh, impoverishing America, impoverishing the middle class. Uh, you know, their, their wages stay about the same, but uh, always buys less. That's, that's where the source of, um, you know, all, uh, my belief is the source of all of the anxiety in America. They just are frantic to preserve and build their wealth. It's an overall plan to overwhelm the government and during the crisis and the collapse, uh, take what they haven't already taken. The, the key p part of this is, is uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt quote. And this isn't by accident. This is on purpose. 
And what is the Cloward Piven strategy? It's a political strategy outlined in 1966 by American sociologist and political activist Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven. It calls for the overloading of the U.S. public welfare statement system and the government in order to precipitate a crisis that would lead to a replacement of the Constitution and the free enterprise capitalist economy with a new socialist Marxist centrally planned economy and an end to poverty through redistribution of wealth and the seizure of it. And, you know, there's a core to the strategy to create ever-growing constituencies uh, dependent on the government for their livelihoods directly through entitlements, social safety nets, and government suppliers in the private sector. It's regulating and taxing the private sector into submission. Healthcare, banking, small businesses, real estate, autos, and, the, and demise while legislating demand to their crony capitalist supporters. And, of course, I'll illustrate that in a moment. And it's uh, to politicize and control the allocation of money and credit. Um, it's to control the public schools and teach dependents, childlike trust in government, and that you are entitled to something for nothing, whether it be health care, food, pensions, liability, disability insurance, shelter. And they're not taught in the new public schools to think for themselves versus uh, well, that's what they do. They want to teach you not to think. Of course, you know, when you and I went to school, they taught uh, self-reliance, the ability to solve problems, logic, importance of hard work, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and the lessons of history, which prepare you to be a good citizen. And uh, like I said, have a mainstream media report misinformation as facts for the useful idiots, which are now being churned out by the millions in the public schools. Tony, you're making a, a series of really good points here on this shift in the school system, and we're going to talk about that later on this this week. But also in regards to shift in in, in attitude uh, towards civic responsibilities, and and that's part of the strategy how it's unfolding. There's something called the rational choice theory, and it's been expounded on for some time by the Rand Corporation. People, I don't think, are fully aware of how a lot of the strategic uh, thinking is formulated in our country through what I refer to as strategic influencers of thought or framers. They're not the deliverers. The deliverers are things like the Department of Education, but the framers are the Council of Foreign Relations, our various institutes like the Tavistock Institute, the Heritage Foundation. Um, there's a whole group of foundations. They get into the Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Group, and then there's corporations out of that like Monsanto, which is, you know, the roots of Donald Rumsfeld, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, the Carlyle Group, as reflected with, you know, David Rubenstein and as the vice chairman of CFR and the Lou Gerstner, form, former chair of, of IBM. But they all are think tanks. They're all private. They're nonprofit. They're funded through private sources or foundations or, or trusts, but they frame these discussions. Cloward Piven is part of the direction and the formulation that have been moving along. The Rand Corporation is a very, very central part of this think tank, and they're the ones that have defied this concept of rational choice theory that I, I was I was leading with here. It moves from people thinking about what's good, what's moral, what's ethical, what's civically right to what's in it for me. The rational choice theory prescribes that making any choice is about acting as a balance of cost against benefit, but acting in your own personal interest. And that's the shift that, that they're going because that's what drives this. That's what starts to drive this uh, Cloward Piven strategy. And last point I'll, I'll make, Ty, I can remember, and, and I, to me it's very evident, uh, when I first came to the United States uh, for a one-year training course when I first started in school, because I spent the vast majority of my career outside of the United States, immigrating later in my life. But I noticed that when I came to the States, people would talk about, we will, or we need to. But it was about an individual. It was about a sense of control and making changes and responsibility. Whereas everywhere else I went in the world, it was always, well, the government needs to do this. The government needs, we can't until they do that. It was somebody else had control. Somebody else was responsible. And I used to marvel at the difference. Now I'll tell you, Ty, that we now talk that way in the United States about everything being government. We have shifted the thinking from the individual to collectivism, and we've shifted 
the attitude to what's in it for me versus what's right, what's moral, what's the American way. We have a whole group of people, and and Obama's taken them from 30% when he uh, arrived in power to almost 47 to 50%, and I think you have numbers that are even greater than that, uh, of people that are on the wagon but not pulling it. Um, they may be getting a paycheck, but they're not really don't know the price of their poor decisions and who they support. And since they're so desperate to just hold on to what lifestyle they have and and take care of their families, they are just willing to vote for any kind of foolishness. And, of course, that also comes uh, from their uh, poor educational backgrounds. But, you know, you close it all off with when you pay, when you rob Peter to pay Paul, you can always count on uh, uh, Paul's support. And uh, there's a lot of Pauls out there. You know, it's amazing what people will go along with to have some sense of security, to believe that they'll be well protected with some level of security. You know, the psychologist Carl Jung made an observation about, and I was talking earlier about collectivism in Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, most citizens of those nations did not necessarily want the formation of a tyrannical oligarchy, but they went along with it because they feared for their own comfort and their livelihoods. And many a German supported the Third Reich simply because they did not want to lose a cushy job or a steady paycheck or they liked that the trains ran on time. And socialism is by far the most selfish movement in history you know, despite the fact that they claim to do what they do for the greater good of the greater number. That's the fallacy of it. And many of our great leaders of over time have, have, have pointed it out. Well, they and they think that uh, by going along, their situation's going to improve. And, uh, you know, everyone's got hope for a better, brighter day. And uh, uh, unfortunately, once uh, you get into these situations, it's very hard to to uh, get out of them. When people have that view and then they're forced with collectivism as opposed to being an individual and standing tough on what their views are as a person of a moral position, of a civic responsibility position, as opposed to going along to get along. And you, you get trapped, you know, on this theme of, uh, of, of, of Germany, how you can distort with propaganda. You know, Hermann Goring at the at the Nuremberg trials, the very famous quote I have up here now, and what he said was, naturally the common people don't want war, but after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag people along, whether it is democracy, fascism, dictatorship, a, parla a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders, this is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in every country, every time. And, you know, when after we came out of 9-11, we suddenly started going in a whole different direction, which accelerated and fed on a lot of the things you're talking about here Ty, there's the grounds of the cloward Piven strategy, which has been, as you point out, going on for 30 years. They love to prey on fear. Fear is one of their greatest weapons in taking your freedom. Exactly. And, and just like um, Ben Franklin said, uh, those who trade freedom for security get neither. And, of course, uh, that's where we're at today. And we uh, have just bull markets and government dependence, uh, Gord. It's uh, just been mushrooming. And, uh, of course, these all, all these people support uh, government because uh, it's uh, in their pay packet on Friday. And uh, it's just uh, uh, as the economy uh, declines under the poor policies of socialists, um, they are forced on to... Uh, different levels of government assistance and, you know, uh, the government's made it pay. I mean, um, as you are probably aware, Gord, that, um, you know, the average pay per day is like $130. If you're on a government assistant, it's like 180 It's like $25 an hour is the medium pay and, and the median pay for somebody that's in all the programs and properly signed up is $30. So it's pretty easy to make the transition because you actually are being paid better. 
And of course, once you get on that, you really are getting on it for semi-permanence. It's so hard to uh, go back to uh, being self-sufficient. And of course, the government makes it easier and easier for you to to uh, to not do it. Well, what supports your strategy, Ty, here at Clark Piven, we've got 25% of the population is currently below the poverty line that are um, are employed and and are working, $23,000 being that poverty line. So what happens is, you know, we've got 107 million Americans on some forms of means-tested government welfare, 46 million seniors collecting Medicare, 10 million on supplemental security, 22 million employees at the, that work at the federal, state, or local level. In other words, we got 165 million people out of 315 dependent on some form of a government transfer. Now tell me, with that level of dependency, are they going to vote for somebody that says the status quo or somebody who's going to say we have to make major cuts? And that's why governments that get into austerity are immediately thrown out or they're forced to kick the can down the road. But the United States is at the point, as a central part of the Cloward Piven strategy, we've now got the dependents at such a level, they're going to vote for, as I said earlier, what's in their best interest as part of this um, clearly spelled out strategy of the rational choice theory. And, of course, we get back to that collectivist uh, uh stuff by the Rand Corporation, where they encourage people to think that we're all in this to take care of each other. Um, that, like I said, they don't teach uh, self-sufficiency anymore. They don't teach self-reliance. They, in fact, say you don't need to do that. We're all in this together. In fact, uh, Obama talked about it, uh, about the promises we make to each other, and that we're not a nation of takers, but he is clearly on the vanguard of the takers. And as you know, I've called the something for nothing society locus. In America, was always a sense of the individual and a sense of freedom. And an individual who made their own choices, they made their own decisions, they did their own thinking. That's different in Europe and around the world of, I'll use the word collectivism, but that we're a sense of, of a society of being together and it's about us, which is which is a right way of thinking, but what happens is you surrender your willingness to stand up and push back. You tend to go with the flow. And so what's happening in America is we're moving from that individual sense to this collectivism. And once you do that, you then get into this role of dependence. And that's what you're pointing out here. And the more that happens, the more you're forced to go along with the collectivism. The more, And so suddenly, if you do stand up and push back and defend the Constitution, defend the Bill of Rights, you're marginalized. And that's how these strategies unfold. And it's not by coincidence. No. That's what people need to understand. And as I said earlier, when I pointed out these framers of public policy, these are, this is very organized. These staff, I mean, Brand has 1,700 employees. The Council of Foreign Relations has 300 employees. These are large institutions. These are all the elites that are creating these policies. And, you know, whether it be the Department of Education, well, that was, what, 1978 or 1979, and so now we've had 10, 20, 35 years of it. So we have two or three generations that have been taught these things, and, you know, humans are like pieces of clay. And if you teach them, it's just like a computer, garbage in and garbage out. And uh, they're, not ta- they're not taught history or anything else. Well, the Department of Education is not really a framer. What they are is a deliverer of these frameworks. And so they pass down by edict down to, because education is a local state responsibility, but they clearly spell out the kinds of things that will be taught, has to be on the agenda, and the textbooks, and the formulation of those textbooks. So it's called revisionist history. And we keep revising the history to suit the political agenda. That's a fact. That's been well documented, and we Ty did a series on, here a while, about a year ago, on on tentacles of deception, where we spelled out exactly how that's been working. It's insidious, and it really is irreversible. Um, you know, it's only going to change after the crisis, and uh, and I'm going to call it the nuclear bomb type crisis. Uh, we just are in a period where um, this is a this is a sociopath, psychopathic uh, snowball. 
And um, these people, this is all they know. This is all they understand. And um, it's all they believe. And there's really not, you can't talk them into it or use rational thought or talk about history because they don't, haven't been taught any of those things. They just aren't critical thinkers. And so we really are, you know, we have people that are now rising to leadership positions that really have no context of history and are just uh, conducting themselves along the lines of, uh, I'll call it uh, the brainwashing they've been fed uh, to enslave them. Yeah, what we've done, Ty, is we've refined the whole arguments of collectivism, centralization, technocracy, slavery, moral relativism, and false flag uh, dupery over the period of time now where this is just um, kind of accepted. We don't like to use words propaganda, but I can tell you, Ty, it's alive and well. Well, I'll call it misinformation, mainstream media, and uh, poor education. Those are the political words of the day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then we've got a government that really uh, doesn't concept, uh, conduct itself in a, in a prudent manner, and uh, I call these the policies of insolvency. And um, there are government programs that, uh, and they're written into law, which consume more than they produce, and they can't pay for them. They impose large new costs on the public with no real benefits in the private sector, and it destroys profitability. It uh, just destroys capitalism. It's a, it's the anti, it's the anti-capitalism. You know, and a, a large part of the funding, or most of it, has just been, oh well. We'll just pay for it one way or another. Obviously, you know, everyone knows that the Social Security trust fund's not there. I mean, you might have paid $5 trillion in, do in dollars into it, but it's it's uh, just a, got a worthless IOU. And between the deficits now, it's it's leading to a national bankruptcy. And, um, and uh, you know, as the... the U.S. gets hollowed out of creating real wealth and producing more than you can consume, they've had to uh, substitute the printing press and uh, debt, which uh, is inextinguishable and unpayable and passed upon to your children. I mean, it's just, I mean, to think that anybody believes they should be paid today on the back of my three and a half year son's future earnings is, uh, is obscenely uh, evil. And, uh, you know, it really uh, is uh, sown throughout government. You know, I've just, I've just listed a few of the things, but I really can't think of one government program that actually works, That I, you know, whether it be the post office or Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or, or anything. I, is there one of them that's not just covered up with money printing and borrowing and sending it to the next, uh, the next generations? I don't think so. One of the world's most famous Nobel economists, uh, Milton Friedman, said that if you know if the government took over the Sahara Desert, within five years there'd be a shortage of sand. Governments do not effectively administrate almost anything. Ty, we're up against our hardline. There's so much to talk about, and you go into this in detail in your presentation, and unfortunately had to highlight some of the key points in it, but. Uh, we have to break. Uh, any closing comments you'd like to make here and um, and also uh, how people could learn more about um, the work that you do? Well, I write a newsletter called Ted Bits, and it's uh, Austrian uh, economic and geopolitical analysis, global macro. And then I also, uh, and the subscriptions are free at tedbits.com or traderview.com. Um, and anybody that is a subscri subscriber will be getting the full PowerPoint uh, probably week after next um, of uh, uh, the Cloward Piven strategy. It's called uh, and the Collapse of the Economy, and I'm working on my 2013 outlook, which I'm doing in a series of, of things uh, called Witch's Brew. And uh, each uh, ingredient uh, I'm going to be covering over the next uh, four to eight weeks, it's a series. And uh, I also am an absolute return alternative investment specialist because, uh, Gord, um, these things uh, are very predictable. Uh, they're actually huge opportunities. But if you uh, really look at uh, the Keynesian illusions and stay thinking that, like you have in the past, uh, you really probably will end up penniless. 
and uh, but uh, the P, that money is going to get transferred somewhere. And uh, you, I believe you have to fix your paper dollars, and you have to learn how to make money when markets go up or when they go down. And that uh, for people younger than 40, uh, it's going to be the greatest opportunity in history. For people over then, they can just make a good return on their money. But, you know, Gord, I, I believe that they're going to get the best buying opportunity in stocks in history. But it's certainly not here. It's going to be from... 60 or 70 or 80 percent lower and the devil is how do i preserve and build my wealth until i can deploy it when things are on sale and so you need to be able to make money when markets go down you need to learn how to fix your paper i'm a manager of managers and an asset allocator and i used manage futures and then i uh, do some other applied austrian things which is called fixing your paper currency and I use gold and silver, just like real you know, gold and silver has been real currency for the last 10,000 years. And I don't think it's going to be changing anytime soon. And you can use long-term option techniques to uh, to fix your paper and stop the printing press. And um, they're powerful. Uh, these are just fabulous additions to people's portfolio. And, and I've worked hard to develop them. Uh, I'm an applied Austrian economist, and uh, I look forward to uh, finding and developing relationships. Ty, we're going to be back together here a little later on in the week, and we're going to pick up on um, another part of the Clower uh, Piven presentation, specifically on uh, what you call, refer to as the new Bill of Rights. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Talk to you later this week. Thank you. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at gordontlong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com.